So we want to talk a little bit about it after we get through hypoxemia and just kind of go back over some of the early signs and the late mm -hmm. signs that you're going to see if a person is having um, difficulty breathing. Or yeah, breathing. I don't think their mic is on. Oh. I'm sorry, I'm done. No, 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 no. It's okay. Hello, 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 hello. Is that better? Is that better? A little bit better. Okay, okay. okay so um, what I was saying is that for hypoxemia, looking at the uh, early signs and late signs, those are good to know because you'll know if you're continuing to do your assessment on your patient that you can see when there is a change and when you need to act according to what you're seeing with your uh, symptoms. So that is just a little bit of a FYI that we have there for you. Let's see if I can get my screen here to switch like it needs to. So next we're gonna cover abnormal cell proliferation disorder, this one being lung cancer. And what is happening in the body is that there are some abnormalities in the cells that normally grow in our bodies, they tend to um, multiply a little bit more than they would if they were normal. And they tend to clump up and they tend to cause issues. So with lung cancer being one of the leading causes of uh, cancer-related deaths in the world or in the U.S., we need to try to make sure that we educate our patients as much as we possibly can. Okay, it's even more prevalent than uh, prostate cancer, breast cancer, and colon cancer. So we have more cases of lung cancer than all of those cancers combined. So when you have a patient who has a advanced uh, lung cancer diagnosis, the treatment often is focused on relieving the symptoms. So we usually are looking towards palliative care for these patients. Um, then too, when we start to look at the cell proliferation, we want to consider has the cancer moved to mm -hmm. other places in the body? Has it metastasized? That's the word. Um, this happens by direct extension through the blood and by invading lymph nodes. You know, our lymph nodes carry a lot of different things, and one of the things that it can do for us is carry some cancer around into the other parts of our bodies. So um, we want to look at to see if there are tumors that may be uh, in the bronchial tubes. The doctors may look at uh, the bronchus to see if there's any obstruction. Um, we want to make sure that there isn't any partial or complete obstruction in those areas. Tumors in these areas of the lungs can grow so large that they can compress uh, and obstruct the airway. So the compression of the alveoli, they can cause all kinds of trouble in the nerve system, the blood vessels, uh, lymph nodes, all of those areas. Okay, so one of the things that we do also is we do staging. We stage lung cancer, okay? And there are many different stages. Uh, so we look at the size, the extent of the disease. We look at the symptoms that the patient may um, tell us about. Um, and then we do the staging. Now staging, you'll get a lot of that if y'all haven't already had your cancer, um, your uh, oncology lecture. You'll get, you know, the staging. It'll talk about the T3, T1, T, all of those different stages and all of that. That's a lot of stuff. Um, even when I was chemo certified, to have to learn as far as getting familiar with staging. If you decide to work in an oncology um, unit or work in a clinic where you give uh, chemo, you will definitely be, uh, they will want you to know how the doctors determine what type of treatment they're going to give to the patients. So lung cancer occurs as a result of repeated exposure to <coughs> inhaled substances. So here I go again, COPD, and now I might have something else going on because I'm always exposed. Okay, so um, the tissue irritation or inflammation interferes with cellular regulation, 
and it, it, it stops that cell growth process that is a normal process of growth and it causes an irregular uh, growth pattern. So cigarette smoking, of course, here we go again, cigarette smoking is a major risk factor, okay, and is responsible for 85% of all lung cancer deaths, okay. So check this out, I thought this was pretty interesting. Non-smokers exposed to secondhand smoke can get cancer as well. Y'all already know that, right? Well, what about third hand? Have y'all heard about this? Mm -hmm. Third hand smokers, so that's good for me. Um, so apparently, a third hand is what, being around items or things like that that has been exposed to cancer. You know, it's, it's like, if we go out in the community, if we walk past somebody, you know, things like that, all of this can cause us to end up in a position where we're diagnosed with cancer and probably never smoked a day in our lives. Um, but there again, you know, it's just a risk that we take. It could be genetics. You know, sometimes it could be things that are genetic that could cause us to pick up the genes and alleles and all of those things that go along with that that causes us to have cancer. So we just never know. I feel like it's a luck of the draw. Because a lot of times there are people that have smoked for the whole, their whole lives. Just like my dad, he smoked cigarettes his whole life. And sometimes he smoked two packs a day. I mean, he was a heavy smoker. And yet, he never had cancer. He never was diagnosed with cancer. So um, that's interesting to know. So some of the warning signals that you may look for in a person who has lung cancer. Some of the warning signals. They may say that they are hoarse. They're having problems with hoarseness, okay? They may have some problems with a change in their respiratory pattern. Well, that's usual because you may have a tumor that's sitting in places that it would normally occupy <laughs> other organs and so therefore, they may say that they're having problems with respiratory issues. Um, they may have a persistent cough. A persistent cough for them is something that they will report. Um, they may say that with that cough, their throat, they're coughing up blood. So they may say they have blood tinged a sputum. Uh, sometimes that sputum may be a rust color. It may be a rust color. So you might, might confuse that with the possibility of having pneumonia because sometimes when patients have pneumonia, they may throw, you know, spit up or cough up some rust colors of uh, uh, sputum. However, if they have cancer, that could be a sign of something that we need to look at further. Okay. Uh, sometimes they'll even have frank blood, frank bleeding, frank hemoptysis uh, that you may see. A lot of blood. Uh, you know, we need to make sure we let the providers know what's going on with that. Uh, and then there are other things that we may not even suspect that could be a problem, such as chest pain. You know, we might consider chest pain, they're, oh, they may be having a heart attack or whatever, but it could be a sign of lung cancer. And on this slide right here that we're looking at, um, this one just kind of tells us where the masses can be located and what type of procedure the doctor may order I've heard a lot of wedge, uh, wedge resections. They do a lot of wedge resections, um, especially over there at Oxner. They do a lot of those. They do the lanectomies too. But at the same time, you can see where on this slide how they're showing you the parts of the lung that they are removing and what that particular procedure is called. So just like um, when we talk about doing our respiratory, doing our respirations and checking our patient and doing an assessment, when we're doing our assessment, uh oh, sorry, I went went way up. So when we're doing our assessment and we are listening to their lung sounds, it's a good idea to know what their um, what their status is. Have they had a surgery? So knowing that. Um, Surgical history is very important, okay? Um, let's see. For them, definitely, though, they'll say something like they've got a frequent cough or something of that nature. So we certainly want to uh, look into that and delve into that and get a little bit more curious and ask them, how long have you had this cough? 
you know, with the car, how, you know, are you having sputum? What color is it? I mean, to get nosy. Ask them all kinds of stuff. That's why I call it get nosy, you know, just to start getting into it, and then that way <coughs> you can uh, find out what's going on with them. My buzzer's not working no more. Oh, my clipper. Turn it off and turn it back on. Let's see if I can do this without it. I'm not here anyway. Okay, so um, we already talked about the leading cause, leading cancer. This thing is killing me. Oh, Brittany, Brittany Spears, I am not, okay? <laughs> <laughs> leading cancer uh, killer is, uh, is lung cancer. Uh, Five-year survival rate. Look at that five-year survival rate, 16%. That's kind of grim, you know? When you're thinking about, you know, the doctor come in and he tells you you got a 50-50 chance, you know, at least you know half, I might, I might get it through this, but, you know, for people to get through five years, 16%, that's, that's pretty darn low. So it kind of it scares you. One of those shock things. And so we talked about the pathophysiology. We talked about how um, the cells and, and how they regenerate and, and sometimes they multiply to the point of where our, our bodies can't get rid of the old and you know make room for the new and then they start to clump and pack up and all of that stuff that we learn when we take uh, biology and such. Um, they, this is what happens here. This is what happens here. And then the risk factors again, secondhand smoke, thirdhand smoke environment, you know, getting that history from the patient, asking them where they work, um, you know, what types of things, chemicals are they around, painters, I can think of painters, I can think of um, coal miners, um, um, all kinds of industries where the lungs are receiving some type of insult. Um, and then two, unfortunately, genetics, we can't do anything about that. A lot of times we can't do anything about the type of job we have, but we also can't do anything about the fact that we are born into a certain family. So um, we definitely have to consider that that could be an issue. And then two, the best thing to do, I feel like, when you have a patient who tells you that they have, and that's one of the reasons why we ask that question, on your uh, physical assessment, you'll get that question uh, about whether uh, your family member, you know, they'll ask you, does your mother have something or does your father have something? It's because the doctor's looking or want to look at, and then sometimes they'll even get deeper and ask you if you have other family members who may have these illnesses so that they can kind of see if there's a pattern and if they may need to look at something a little bit further, at least a good doctor or good, you know, nurses and things like that. A good doctor, I say, because those are the ones, to me, would be the ones responsible for making sure that they go further, you know, and let you know, you know, if you're at risk for something that needs to be taken care of. So there's, uh, we have the non-small cell cancer and then the small cell cancer. And the one that we don't want, of course, we can see is in red. The one that we don't want the doctor to tell us that we have. So we um, definitely it grows fast and it's aggressive. So that one, usually, like I said, whenever we have a patient come in and we do the biopsies and such, and we find that there is a tumor, they want to go ahead and start doing testing and find out, you know, what exactly they're working with so that they can get those patients in as quickly as possible. Whenever you're uh, getting a doctor's appointment sometimes and it takes you months to get into a doctor, this is one instance when you would be a priority at getting into the doctor and getting <coughs> your care. And that's a good thing. And so here, the small cell lung cancer is just kind of comparing and contrasting mm -hmm. what's going on with the two of them, the 15 to 20 percent of cases um, usually don't survive, you know, or survive, or, you know, it's just, it's, it's a hard thing to deal with, with this particular type of illness. Um, 
stage one, it goes from stage one, and that talks about all the different stages that usually you'll see in this particular type of cancer. Um, Non-small cell cancer, 80% of cases usually don't do very well when they have this type of diagnosis. Um, it includes the squamous cell carcinomas, usually centrally located, and we're not, again, going to get too deep into all of that. And see, here's where I was talking about the staging, how they go in there and they look at that N1, N2, all of that. When you do your certification, is something that you would, if you wanted to follow into that particular field of nursing, then you would learn how to stage your cancers. You would also learn how to give your patients their chemo and how the days are set up and how, you know, like they're going to be sick on this day or they'll get day seven, they'll get, you know, off this many days. And then you could kind of, they'll be in a rhythm so that you know when that patient is going to end up coming back into the hospital. Because just like clockwork, after they've had that chemo, they're in the hospital because they're running fever or something like that. And usually, we don't want them to have a fever. You know, when they're in the 99s or something of that nature, we bring them in because we want to try to make sure we keep uh, any infection or anything at bay. So again, we talked about the signs and symptoms that go along with the cancers, all of that pretty much straightforward. They're going to say that they've had a cough. Uh, it's a chronic cough. They're going to say that they're short of breath. They may have some bleeding. They may have some uh, coughing up blood. Uh, again, the chest and shoulder pain. That's one of the things that you may think that this patient is having a heart attack. But it is definitely a sign that there could be something going on and that tumor is pressing against areas that are causing them to have the chest and shoulder pain. And then, of course, they're going to have a recurring fever. So those are things that they may say, I have fever, chills, that kind of thing they'll report. And of course, we will look into that and putting the whole picture together and with the biopsies and all of that that goes along with it will possibly be the things that'll give us a, a diagnosis. Now, here, of course, of the surgical, this is the management that we're looking at as far as these patients are concerned. And surgery is one of them. It's, it's totally an option. Uh, for these patients, and that is if uh, chemo and if radiation is something that, you know, is not an option. Um, this is typically used with the non uh, small cell. We got to do that surgical resection since we want to try to get rid of as much of that cancer as we possibly can. Um, a mm -hmm. lot of times you'll have your patients that'll have the radiation. Uh, radiation, of course, usually, even within your certification, you'll have a particular group of nurses who, do, who does the radiation treatment. And the reason for that is because we don't want them to be, or too many nurses to be exposed to radiation. They have to wear the vest, they have to wear the shields and all of that. And usually these patients are set up so that they have some type of shield to block whenever you're in there doing care as much as possible to keep the radiation down. And then we also have meters that we use when we go in the room and work with these patients to let us know how much exposure we've had to the radiation, okay? So once we are at a certain level, you know, we try to make sure we get out of that room. So the most important thing I guess I could say as far as taking care of a patient who is getting radiation is that it is absolutely important to make sure that before we go in the room, we get everything that we need to take in that room and provide the care that we need to provide for them. So we always want to be very coordinated in what we do. We get in, we get out, we don't take anything out of the room, okay? And then even when we take these patients home, when we teach them at home, their urine is toxic, their all body fluids are toxic, so we have to teach the patient and the family to be very extra cautious around, you know, using the bathroom. If, they're, if they have the luxury of having separate bathrooms, it's better that they use separate bathrooms. Okay? And typically, again, 
like I said, palliative care for these patients is what we're going to do. We're going to get do comfort measures. Okay, thoracic surgery. So a thoracotomy. I'm going to get rid of some of the lung, take it out. So what I want you to know is like everything that's right here in the thoracotomy, um, what we want to do is our responsibility. This is the care. This is what we need to do for them. And of course, it's right here. We need to turn them every hour. We need to turn them from their back, okay, to the operative side, okay? So that's the reason why it's every, usually it's like every two hours or so. So see, these patients are a little bit different. They need to have uh, their care provided to them just a little bit differently. And usually when it's this kind of it, uh, situation, I don't leave this to my, my staff because I'm going to be giving them, you know, telling them other things and other patients that they can take care of. But for this particular patient, I will probably be the one to make sure I do the turning myself because that way I know that they're getting the care that they're supposed to be getting. Not because I don't trust them to do it, it's just because I want to make sure that, you know, they're going to heal properly and there's not going to be any complications. Okay, so, I'll tell you this did it again. Okay, this is gonna be the fun part if I can ever get to it. <laughs> we, gotta make, we gotta make sure we get them up the wall. So just imagine, somebody just had a surgery, your patient just had a surgery, and you're telling them that you gotta get them up and walk them. Mm -mm. They're not going to want to do it because they are in such pain. This is a, a painful, painful procedure. And so it is up to us to make sure that we get them the pain medications that they need. This is not the time to say that um, Mr. So-and-so or Mrs. So-and-so is uh, pain med seeking. That's not the time to do that because they really hurt. So we want to definitely make sure that we get them their pain medications so that they can participate. That's the reason we need to do that, so that they can participate in um, helping to reinflate or do whatever we need to do to heal that lung, to get that lung to a place where they're able to go home. So we get them up and we walk them, okay? So a low back to me, when they have a low back to me, we see that they are gonna take a little bit of the lung, we're gonna remove some of that lung, Okay, and then of course we may have to put a chest tube in, okay? That's how we're gonna get that lung re-expanded. We're gonna get that chest tube in there. I'm gonna talk about chest tubes. I believe you get some of that today. Okay, and then there's another different type of procedure, the pneumonectomy, okay? I'm gonna take a little piece, just a little piece, not all. And see, you know what they say here, they tell you, I'm tell you why they say the removal of the right lung is more dangerous. You know, you, the, the right lung supplies most of your oxygen. That's the side that you get most of your oxygen from, and it's vascular. There's more of a vascular band there. <coughs> so over on that side, we really have to be, you know, know which side that the surgeries were on uh, once we have that patient come to us. So here is uh, just a little diagram to show you what the differences are. You have your wedge resection, you have your lobectomy, they're taking the whole lobe, then a pneumonectomy, they're taking the whole lung. Okay, so they're wedging a little bitty piece. Y'all, I tell you what, I cut that thing off. My cat has to go get rogue, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> well, good because it's not your car warranty. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay, so let's see. So anyway, uh, wedge resection, uh, wedge resection. Uh, we can see here there's a little wedge that they're taking out. A low back to me, they took out a whole load. And a pneumonectomy, they took out a whole lung. Okay, so know the difference in what which ones are which. All right, so support. 
of course, support. What are your treatment options? What type of cell uh, cancer do you have? Um, what are we going to need to have chemo? Are we going to need to have radiation? Are we going to need to, you know, talk about hospice? That's a hard thing to talk about. A lot of times, patients and family members don't want to talk about it. You know, it takes a little bit of time for them to get ready for such mm -hmm. a thing. And uh, definitely, we need to be prepared to do that. And if you decide to go and work in one of these units, you gonna be you, that's gonna be you're gonna have to do it because a lot of times these doctors have gotten to the place where they have it's so second nature to them until they'll just walk in and they'll say you have six months to live and walk right back out. I have had that happen. Um, a doctor walked in and told the patient they got six months to live and walk back out and left. And so who's going to be there left to pick up the pieces? You are. You're going to be the one that's going to get the backlash of what was just told to that patient. You know? And sometimes when you have a relationship with your doc uh, enough so that you can go back to them and you can say, you know, maybe you need to go back and talk to them a little bit better. I don't know if it was that it was a bad day or what was going on, but that happened. So we talked to them about the end of life. Um, you know, I think that a, can, a, a nurse that works in a, chemo, in a cancer unit is just like a, a um, hospice nurse. You could put the two together, you could marry them, and it would be, you know, something that they would need to do because they have to do that. We have to take care of pain. We certainly have to do that. Um, and we, they're tired all the time. They may be vomiting all the time. Uh, malnutrition is a problem. You're going to see TPN. For these patients. So when you take care of someone on the unit who has uh, chemo, you're probably going to end up seeing them uh, connected to TPN and they'll probably have lipids as well. So that's something to be expected. Um, you'll, you'll get a lot of, you'll get a lot of um, antibiotics, constantly antibiotics. And you'll have, this is uh, one of those units too where you got frequent flyers because these patients are typically uh, the patients of the doctors on the unit and you will see them often. So, you know, it, it's a good thing in a way. And it's a bad, it can be a bad thing. Like I said about the young man who was diagnosed and, and we watched him, you know, move through his stages and he, did, he was unsuccessful. So, um, next we're gonna talk about pneumothorax. We're gonna talk about pneumothorax, um, hemothorax and chest tube. Let's see here. We can get some stuff together for you on that. What you need to know about that. I want to do chest tubes first. Do y'all mind? Mm -hmm. Can I do chest tubes first? Mm -hmm. Okay. Alright. So with a chest tube. There's just a couple of things that we want to know about that. Pulmonary contusions. Pulmonary contusions. There are three components. Uh, edema leaking into the serum protein. Plasma osmotic pressure is filled in the alveoli, and then that's going to cause you to have a pulmonary contusion. Um, a hemorrhage. A hemorrhage could be an issue. Okay. Atelectasis may result. Uh, from the fluid that fills in the alveoli, and the treatment involves tight control. We need to make sure if there's a pulmonary contusion, we need to make sure that we watch them closely because we don't want the lung to collapse or something of that nature. So, when it comes to chest tubes, let's see if we can um, give you the meat and potatoes of what you're going to need. So in a chest tube, a drain is placed in the pleural space, okay? Uh, it is going to prevent air and fluid from returning to the chest. I need to make sure I mark that down. Okay, what does the chest tube do? It's going to make sure that air and fluid does not return to the chest, okay? Did I say that right? Can I see? The chest tube also prevents air and fluid from returning to the chest. Okay, that's what it does. It's a drainage system. 
It consists of one or more chest tubes or drains. A collection container is placed below the chest level. You're going to see that question. I don't care how many times you take boards. You're going to see that question. The chest tube is placed below the chest level. Okay? And the water seal is going to keep the air from entering the chest. The drainage system may be a stationary, disposable, self-contained system, or it could be a smaller portable one. The portable ones are used for patients who can go home with a chest tube. They go home with a chest tube and they surely are going to have home health to come in and see them. Okay? So what are we going to do? The tip of the tube is used to drain air, I mean, I'm sorry. The tip of the tube used to drain air is placed near the front of the long apex. That's where it's placed, okay? And then the tube that drains liquid is placed on the side near the base of the lung. So after lung surgery, two tubes, anterior and posterior, so like when you go and check on your patient, it, and I, maybe if y'all have already had a chest tube, you'll see like one tube will be coming up in the front, and then there'll be one kind of toward the back. Sometimes they'll have it that way. And um, the wounds are covered. They'll have them covered with an airtight dressing. So that's why whenever, if a tube comes out or something like that, that's why you need to make sure to get that dressing back on there because we need to keep that air pressure, we need to keep that tight, okay? The chest tube is connected by about six feet of tubing. It needs to be a pretty good bit of tubing going on there, okay? Okay, so let's talk about a stationary chest tube drainage system. The stationary uh, chest tube drainage system is uh, uses a water seal mechanism, and that's the one we usually will see a lot, the water seal, okay? It acts as a one-way valve to prevent air or liquid from moving back into the chest cavity. Air and liquid cannot go back into the chest because this system is going to keep that from happening. And what is the name of the system? The plural vac. The plural evac system is the most common device used um, to do this to help keep the air in the, uh, during, in the liquid from moving back. Okay, the plural system is a common device using one piece, a one piece disposable unit with three chambers. It has three chambers. So the three chambers are connected to one, they're connected to one another. The tubes from the patient is connected to the first chamber. The tube from the patient is connected to the first chamber. And like I said, I, I, I go over this because it's going to be, it's, it's a known given. You need to know where the tubes are connected. You need to know what it does, all of those things, and how to place it on the floor. Okay? How to place it below the chest, how to place it wherever it needs to be placed. The tubes from the patient is connected to the first chamber, okay, in the series of three. It's connected to the first one. This chamber is the drainage collection chamber. This is the drainage collection chamber. The second chamber, that's the water seal, okay? And what it's going to do is it's going to prevent air from moving back up the tubing system and into the chest. The second chamber is going to prevent air from moving back up the tubing into the chest. Okay? Now the third chamber. The ch third chamber, when suction is applied, is the suction regulation. It just regulates the suction. Is it okay for me to have bubbling in my chamber? Yes. It is. It's okay to have bubbling. Okay. Is it okay to have tidling? To have what? Tidling. What well, tidling? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it will. Sometimes it will have tidling. Yeah. Um, tidling, like if they cough, <coughs> if someone coughs, if they cough, you know, you might see that a little bit. Okay. And setting up the system, chamber one does not 
at first have fluid in it. Remember, chamber one is going to have fluid in it at first. The tubing from the patient penetrates shallowly into the chamber as does the tube connecting chamber one with two. Chamber one collects the fluid draining from the patient. See, it's not going to have any fluid in it at first because it's going to collect the fluid that's going to come out of the patient. That's number one. The fluid in the chamber, in chamber one, must never fill. Make sure that you keep check on it often and, and you know, actually put your marks on it. You know, when you get a report, make sure that your nurse knows where your marks are so that you can keep up with it. It needs to be, this fluid is measured hourly. It's measured hourly because you're going to have more drainage during the first 24 hours, okay? The fluid in chamber one must never fill to the point that it comes into contact with any tubes. It should never run, be able to run back into your tubes, okay? So that's what I need you to know about chamber one. Okay, so, and we definitely don't want it to enter into chamber two for sure. No, don't want it to run over. Okay. The bubbling, so now we talked about bubbling, right? The bubbling of water in the water seal chamber indicates air drainage from the patient. Okay, the bubbling, the bubbling indicates air drainage from the patient. Bubbling is seen when intrathoracic pressure is greater than atmospheric pressure, such as when the patient exhales, when they cough, or when they sneeze. So sometimes you'll see some bubbling when they exhale, cough, or sneeze. When the air in the pleural space has been removed, bubbling stops. Mm -hmm. When the air is removed, bubbling stops, okay? We don't want to see excessive bubbling, right? We don't want it to be excessive bubbling because this may indicate that there's an air leak. We don't want it to be excessive because we may have an air leak. Okay. The water in the narrow column of the water seal chamber normally rises and you'll, you'll get this one, it normally rises two to four inches during inhalation. So when my patient takes a breath in, that water is gonna go two to four inches. Go up, it's gonna go up, okay? And what is this called? It's called tidally, it's called tidally. An absence of fluctuation could mean something good. If there's no fluctuation, that could be a good thing because we might have a reinflated lung. And that's a good thing. So we look for those and that's the reason why you need to know because surely in goodness of mercy, if you work on a med surge floor, eventually you're going to end up with a patient who has a chest tube. And so you don't freak out because you know what each one of these things means. When it's time to set that uh, system up, just like I said, when we get ready to do procedures with the physician and they're going to come up and they're going to throw in a chest tube, we need to get everything that we need to gather. We need to be prepared and we need to know how to care for that chest tube. I mean, you know, it can be daunting and it can be, um, at, at times you can feel like, God, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. But if you just know the basics. You know, if you know the basics, then you can, there's always someone there that can help you with your chest tube, but as long as you know what is not normal, you know how to care for them with the normal. And that's the way I see that one. So in, in chamber three, is it time for break? <laughs> that's okay. Chamber three is the set, is the suction control system. So chamber three. There are different types of suction, most commonly wet to dry. With the wet suction, the fluid level in chamber three is prescribed by the primary care physician. So don't freak out. If a chamber three needs to have something in it, the doctor needs to put, to, needs to tell you what it needs to have in it, okay? Okay. 
So um, the chamber is connected to wall suction, which is turned up until there is a gentle bubbling. So when you connect it to the wall suction, there's going to be a gentle bubble in the chamber. That's normal. With the dry suction, the primary health care provider prescribes the suction level to be dialed in on the device. So there's going to be some kind of uh, system on your device where you're able to dial it in or he'll dial it in. Okay. When connected to wall suction, you'll dial it in. He'll dial it in. Either one. The regulator is set to the amount indicated by the device's manufacturer. Okay, so in these devices, there's going to be something in the manufacturer's uh, information that's going to tell you how to use this particular chamber. So what the, the gist of this is that there are different types of chambers. Your doctor will order which one you need to have. It is up to us to know that if there's a three chamber, how we need to care for it and what needs to happen and what bubbling means and what titling means and how we need to check the drainage and those types of things. That is the important thing for us to understand. All the other stuff is just a matter of the doctor telling me what type of system he wants me to, to use. Oops. That was an accident for real. Don't look at it. Don't look at it. I don't know. It's, just, it's going crazy. I'm not doing that on purpose, y'all. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. All right, let's try to close it out. We'll go back on here. All right, I'll tell you what, while we just take a break, while I'll see if I can get the thing going again, I'm using it anyway. I'm such a, um, do my own. No, you can go ahead and take a break. Y'all go ahead and take a break. Let's take a break. Let's take um, hey, 10 minutes. <laughs> 10 minutes and we'll be out of here by 10 until 3. How's that? That sounds good. Yeah. Oh,
We're going to monitor for subcutaneous emphysema. Sometimes when you go in and you check your patient and you feel around the chest tube area, you may feel a, a type of a crackling of some sort. So you want to monitor for that. Okay, and then there's more information again, like we said, I talked about the uh, diagrams and such that you'll find on your chest tube so that you can look at the information related to that. So now we're going to go back and we're going to talk a little bit about your hemothorax. And basically right here, to open, I want to skip over this, I'm going to come back to that. Okay. I'm just going to go back to that one so we don't have to be confused, okay? So we're going to talk about your hemothorax. Results from fluid filled in the alveolar. 
And then the treatment for this involves tight control. We want to definitely possibly give diuretics to the patient. Um, we're going to give fluid therapy and we're going to want to work on keeping down uh, hyponolemia. Okay, we don't want them to go into shock or anything like that, so we need to make sure we uh, give them diuretics. Okay, so blunt, blunt injuries and penetrating injuries. Yeah, these are pretty, um, pretty gross looking things, but we, these are some of the things that can happen um, with chest trauma and they have to be treated. Usually they come in the, um, come into us and they've got lines running uh, all different places, probably will need to have a chest tube or they may have already had a chest tube place when they come in um, on the ambulance. But this is basically just a, a visual to show you some of the injuries that can occur when a person has had some type of chest trauma. So there's a blunt. You can see in the blunt, you can't really see any type of opening there but then the penetrating um, wound, you see where in the back you have the holes that are open there with the patient, so that could be an issue as well. That will need to be treated. So the most common of the blunt force, usually from a possible airbag or some type of motor vehicle accident where um, head-on collisions, that type of thing, bicycles, those are some of the issues where you might see a person that would have a blunt force uh, injury and therefore cause some type of lung um, issue. Now, in a penetrating issue, in a penetrating um, issue, we're gonna have like a stab wound, somebody that has been shot with a gun. Um, you'll see um, a chest tube will need to be placed possibly for that, more than likely, if they're um, shot in the chest. So those are some of the issues where you may see a penetrating um, chest wound. Okay? So our assessment, what are we going to be looking at? Airway obstruction, that's going to be our main focus. We certainly want to make sure that we're keeping their airway open. If we don't have an airway, we don't have a patient, right? Okay. Uh, tension pneumothorax, open pneumothorax, those are our priority things that we need to look at. A flail chest, we talked about that. What are we going to see with a flail chest? We're probably going to see a mid-shift, the medial sinus shift. We're going to see all of those different things, so we need to definitely look at that. A cardiac tamponade, those might be an issue. What is going to be our secondary assessment? We're going to inspect this patient. We're going to see what, what they look like, what the chest look like. What's the respiratory rate? How are they breathing? Is there any difficulty breathing? What about cyanosis? Are, they, are the lips blue? Are the finger, the nail beds blue? We're going to look at that. We're certainly going to look at the symmetric, symmetric, symmetric movement of the chest. Is it moving up and down like it needs to? So we need to watch that as well. And then, of course, we're going to look at their vital signs. Okay. Of course, we know that if we're dealing with a patient that has had some type of injury to their chest, Chest x-ray is always going to be the first thing that we want to do because we want to see what is going on with the chest. We're going to do a CT scan. We certainly want to use that in order to help us to diagnose what the problem may be with the patient. Then we have the labs. Labs will need to be done for our patient as well. Clotting studies may be a factor that we need to have. And then our ABGs. And we go back to our ABGs and we're going to talk about those again. That up. Okay, so with our ABGs, we certainly want to make sure that we check the PAO2, and we're looking at the elevations. We talked about that, and we said that if there is an elevation in our ABGs, there could be possibly something going on with excessive oxygen. Okay, too much oxygen administration. So we need to make some adjustments. We need to also look at decreased levels, which could indicate that the patient has some type of injury or illness, such as COPD. It's very, um, an illness that is very uh, much on our minds, if dealing with the fact that we're here in the South and we have a lot of patients who have uh, been diagnosed with COPD. <laughs> 
Um, probably because of where they work. Again, we talked about that. We talked about environmental issues that could cause us to have problems even though we are not uh, a smokers. So we need to get that good health history on our patients. Uh, those of us who have asthma, we need to look at the ABGs in order to determine if that could be an issue. Uh, we, again, we need to look at the fact that they may have something going on with the bronchioles. There may be cystic fibrosis. Um, and we also need to look at the respiratory distress syndrome. That could be an issue. Uh, if there is an elevation in your ABGs, there could also be atelectasis, as we said before. Usually when there's COPD, there is an issue with atelectasis. There could be because of the destruction of the alveoli. Uh, again, we want to look at the PaCO2. With the PaCO2, there could be elevations as indicated in COPD, okay? In asthma and in pneumonia as well. The pH, Usually, um, if they're up to 60 years old, keep this in mind, up to 60 years old, you're probably going to see the numbers being somewhere around 7.35 to 7.45, okay? <laughs> As your patient get older, it gets older, and which we want to focus on in these particular studies because we're going through the lifespan, we want to look at the fact that those numbers may be a little bit more elevated. You may see them run somewhere around 7.31 to 7.42. So we need to make sure that we are looking at that. Elevations may indicate metabolic or respiratory alkalosis. That's important to uh, take note of, okay? So if our pH is elevated, it may be metabolic or respiratory alkalosis. Now, say for instance we have a patient greater than 90 years old. Sometimes it does happen. So if we do, we may see numbers somewhere around 7.26 to 7.43. Make sure that you are looking at those numbers and understanding that if they are elevated or decreased, what you might you see? We talked about that a little bit earlier, right? We said that it is important to understand if the numbers are elevated, not so much that we, and we need to know what the numbers are, but also we need to know what we might see in our patients and what we might be looking for. And also understand that the patient who's older may have an elevation or slight elevation in their numbers. Okay, so we don't want to freak out about the fact that the numbers may be a little bit uh, higher with our elderly. Uh, the other thing we want to look at too is if we look at our ADGs and we find that there is a decrease if there's decreased levels, if the numbers are lower, then that may indicate that the patient has respiratory alkalosis, okay? Because they are trying to compensate, and so therefore, respiratory alkalosis may be an issue. Now, another thing too, when we talked about the Allen test earlier, and um, if you have a patient who has to have uh, ABG done and they ask you a question, they may say, well, why would I need to have this done? Why would I need to have an Allen test done? What do we say about that? What, do y'all remember what we said about that? <laughs> it's gonna show your blood flow, okay? It's gonna show blood flow. So if they ask you that question, then you know you wanna tell them that this is gonna help it, uh, show a, a good indicator of the blood flow in that area. So when you have your respiratory therapist come in, she'll probably want to do that with you, okay? All right. Okay, so the flail chest, segment of the thoracic wall becomes unattached in a flail, in a flail chest. A part of the thoracic wall becomes unattached, okay? It comes unattached from the rest of the chest wall. So usually that can happen, like we said, in blunt force injury or something of that nature, you'll see that type of injury, okay? So we want to definitely look at that. A lot of times if you work in the emergency room, you're going to see these types of things. They come in, so you'll be looking for that. Looking for uh, doing your assessment. You'll do those quick assessments. You'll uh, make sure that you know what, what you're seeing. And of course, you're gonna get the exams done, the tests done in order to determine uh, that this is actually what's going on with that particular patient, okay? 
And on this next slide, what we're going to be seeing here is exactly the mechanism of the uh, flail chest. What's <coughs> happening? It kind of shows you how that um, lung is, I guess, not expanded, but not expanded, and how it's pushing over to the side. And see where you get that mediastinum shift that we was talking about? See how it moves over, and you can see that you have some issue going on, and more than likely, you're definitely going to have to get some type of get that lung reinflated one way or another. So you're looking at probably having them with the chest tube uh, to get that taken care of. Okay. Okay. Medical management here. Uh, first and foremost, okay. Mm -hmm. We need to assess the degree of respiratory distress and we need to treat it, whatever it may be, whatever we need to do. And that's possibly, uh, definitely going to be making sure we get oxygen on our patients, okay? We talked also about a local anesthetic, okay? We need to do that because these patients are going to be in pain. They're gonna have a lot of pain, okay? Okay. If a segment is impairing gas exchange, what are we going to do? In a flail chest, we can think almost indefinitely that these patients are going to have to have some kind of mechanical ventilation, right? They're going to need to have that in place, okay? Extreme cases, surgical intervention is going to be required. We need to have them uh, have some kind of surgery in order to correct this issue. And then we've talked about your pneumothorax. I kind of put that in the two together, the pneumothorax and the hemothorax. We talked about the collapsed lung. Uh, air gets into, uh, gets into the air between um, the lungs and the chest wall. Okay, gets into the spaces. Lungs cannot fill with air. I'm sorry. It, yeah. <laughs> That's a mis mis mistype. Uh, uh, the body is getting decreased oxygen, okay? The body is getting decreased oxygen just to wrap that up, okay? And there, we went back over it again because it's so much to cover as far as these disease processes are concerned. We talked about the three, okay? We have the simple, which is spontaneous. I want to say sometimes, I think I had a patient once, a little older lady, and um, you know, just from moving around and walking, she developed a spontaneous pneumothorax and she was diagnosed with that. Uh, just, you know, the, the chest wall and all of that is just kind of not like it used to be. Remember, we talked about the older people, their chest wall, uh, their di di diaphragm, all of that is different. It changes. And so, therefore, she was at risk and she had a simple pneumothorax. Okay? Uh, traumatic blunt injuries can cause issues and cause you to have a pneumothorax. So we have the second one, which is a traumatic pneumothorax. And then we have the tension pneumothorax. So those are the three that you're looking at and just kind of know the difference between those three and uh, what can happen with each one. Okay. okay, and this is a picture that kind of gives you an idea of what you're seeing. You see how much space you have there with that lung, and then that lung is, that pneumothorax, is, it's collapsed there, and that lung is just like a tiny baby's lung. <laughs> so that's what happens. It gives you a visual and shows you exactly what's going on inside the body when they uh, develop a pneumothorax. I thought that was a pretty nice picture to give you that visual, because I need the visual understand sometimes what's going on. Okay, so signs and symptoms. They're probably going to have a dry cough, okay, and a definitely shortness of breath, always shortness of breath, okay? These patients are going to be cyanide. You're probably going to see blue around the lips. You're probably going to see, if they're, uh, keep in mind, if they are of color, they'll probably have some cyanosis in the mouth, okay? So you can look in the oral cavity and see that they may have some cyanosis there. There's going to be some cyanosis around the hands, okay? You're going to look at those nail beds and check those out. See how they're confused and see where that oxygen is going, if it's not going at all. Uh, chest pain, does it radiate to the back? Do they complain of that? They may have that uh, referred type pain. The pain is going from one place to the other. <laughs> and we talked about also chest pain and uh, confusing the symptoms 
of the chest pain <coughs> with um, having a heart attack. So we don't want to do that, okay? Uh, and then you're going to hear something. You're going to hear a noise, and it's going to sound like a sucking sound, okay? To me, when I think of that sucking sound, I think about a balloon. You know how a balloon, and, and it sucks back in? So I get that in my head, and I say, okay, this is what I'm, I'm hearing. This is what I'm seeing. Um, this is uh, what they're telling me, if they can tell me. So, you know, all of those things put together, knowing that there was a possible uh, condition that could have caused this pneumothorax might lead me to think that this could possibly be what's going on with my patient, okay? Okay, and so there again, with these patients, they come in, they're gonna have to have a thoracentesis, okay? We're definitely gonna place that chest tube, always, you know, that's always gonna be one of those major issues that we're gonna be dealing with. They come to the floor, they been in emergency, they've been in ICU, wherever they've been, they come to us, and then they're gonna have a chest tube. And we're gonna know how to manage that chest tube, right? We went through that, we talked about it, we talked about the chambers, we talked about the bubbling and the titling and all of those things and what we need to know in order to manage our chest tube. Okay, what about the shifting? We're gonna look at that, we're gonna assess that. Whenever we go in and we uh, check our patient, we're assessing to make sure that there isn't a shift. That that chest, that that area up there is not in a shift, okay? Um, so all of these things we're going to be looking at when we're caring for our patient. Okay. So attention pneumothorax, again, we talked about this, and we talked about it. Uh, the penetrating trauma creates a one-way valve, so to speak. Air leaks from the lung into the pleural space, mm -hmm, and is unavailable to escape. It has nowhere to go. <coughs> can't get rid of it, okay? So there is increased intrapleural pressure, okay? And it, interfere, it interferes with the <coughs> turn, okay? And blood pools, and then you're gonna possibly have shock or collapse, the cardiac system, shock and collapse. What is the immediate goal? The immediate goal is to alleviate the intrapleural pressure. Okay, we need to do that and we need to do it quickly using a chest tube because that's going to help get some of that pressure off. Okay, or the doctor may do a thoracentesis. Okay, so those are going to be some of the procedures that you may see a doctor use if you have a tension pneumothorax. Um, now we're going to talk a little bit about um, the pleural effusion here, talking about the, uh, okay, we're going to go, we're going to go into, we're going to talk about, we done, we done, yeah. can I ask a question real quick, so, <laughs> A needle thoracotomy, a needle thoracotomy, yes, nurses can do that, specialized nurses usually, it's not everybody in their mind. Yeah, usually it is, um, it is a specialized nurse, you know, in the military, in the military, right? See, in the military, you get to do all that stuff like that. Yeah, 
Are there any more? Do you want to have all three times, or just kind of like in general? Like, do you want to have a question? Yeah, I'm very excited. I mean, all of this. See, the thing is, when I was out last semester, a lot of this information is has been changed. So the way I had my stuff set up before this is not set up that way. So I have to try to work around what it is now. So in that respect, I'm jumping around from place to place. I'm jumping around and I'm jumping around. <laughs> but at the same time, that's not fair to y'all. So I will most definitely make sure that I review everything and let you know, you know, how we need to go about doing our I was great appreciate that. Coming back up from the but y'all feel wrong for that, you know that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so anyway, let's see if we can look at this uh, video if I can get it pulled up. Does anyone have any of those uh, out of there? Here, here, here's one. I just want to read it. You can have
because I bet you some of the flu was probably mixed. Right, but then it was after the fact that the patient had already pulled out his chest tube, they just put it back in, and he knocked it over. And so, yeah, she was having a nurse yesterday. I bet. Maybe they But anyway, so yeah, um, and then connections. Checking the connections and making sure that they are um, connected properly. So do that whenever you take report and get, you know, your information on a patient. And also make sure that there is water in there, whatever needs to be in those chambers. If it's supposed to be a water seal, make sure you go in there and the nurse told you it's a water seal and you see it dry in the bones, that's a problem. So yeah, all of those things, you check on that. Intermittent bubbling is okay. That's proper, proper function. All right, dry suction seal. Here's the three chambers, it's quieter. That's the thing. You know, I believe that one was a dry seal. Um, but it's a little bit quieter, um, so that may be something that a patient may complain about the other seal being, because you can actually hear it bubbling when you have those other ones going. You can hear them going. So. And um, the different types just kind of gives you an idea of what they look like. Okay. What do you do if the tooth comes apart? Okay. What do you do if it comes apart? They always tell you to take that and, and drop it right. Mm -hmm. That's what you need to do. Uh, you need to make sure that you're able to get that water seal reestablished. You want to get it reestablished. That's your main thing, get it reestablished. Um, so there we go on that. Um, let's see. If the chest tube becomes dislodged from the patient, these are your steps and things that you should do. And we all know that we need to put a dry seal. It used to be back in the day, they used to tell us to put like a gauze dressing. But it has changed since then. Uh, and it is a dry sterile gauze dressing now uh, with these patients in order to uh, give you time to get that um, tube back in if you need to. So did you actually see the patient pull the tube out or? I actually got to see him bleed everywhere. So okay. the tube was out, uh -huh. they called in immediately, they, they ended up having to talk with some pulmonologist, uh -huh. was caught up doing something else, but finally when he did come, they went back in, cleaned the site, um, they cleaned it with sterile water, and, uh, but they can pat it dry, and like that. at the same time they had, they were on the verge of intubating the patient because they, they were just trying to make sure, because both, yeah, chest tubes bilaterally. Uh -huh. But the one on the right side, one pulled out and it just happened to fall off the floor, but then they had up had the hemothorax, uh -huh. they had this up there and put chest tube, but they ended up having a separate drain, it's almost like, it's like a JP drain, mm -hmm. but it didn't have the JP bulb on it, but it was enough just to pull an excess drainage off, right. but then they had the chamber go up, but then he repeatedly ended up doing that on the chest tube. Wow, I'm surprised that they didn't put him on a unit or something and put him down, you know. Yeah, the unit kind of put him down. Put him down. Yeah. 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 Placement and sharing of the wet uh, right, seal. Mm -hmm. Okay. In a plural chest drainage, the major uh, hazard is a tension pneumothorax. So we don't want that to happen. The most likely cause is obstructive tubing. So we check all of our tubings. And remember, it's a lot of tubing. It's almost six feet of tubing that they have running from them. 
So, uh, and we quickly assess the tubing's patency and notify the doctor mm -hmm. immediately if there's an issue. Okay. Are there signs of respiratory distress? Any, any sign of respiratory distress, we don't want it at all. Okay. Is the dressing clean and dry? That's another thing that we want to make sure of. Is the dressing clean and dry? Is there crepitus? The crepitus, we talked about the, um, you feeling around the, uh, around the area. Can you feel anything? Can you hear anything? Uh, so you're going to palpate around the area where the chest tube insertion is. Has the thoracic cavity been pulled, or, I'm sorry, the catheter been pulled out of the chest, um, out of the chest? We want to make sure that the catheter, that all of that is in place, that the catheter is in place, okay? So that's our responsibility when we have a chest tube. Oh, that thing just too big. Oh, oh what the, oh, what's like that? <laughs> Mark any drainage on the dressing and notify the doctor of its significance or if it's significant, okay? Notify him if there's a significant amount. Let's see what happens next. Oh. Change the dressing according to hospital policy. Okay, if it's, uh, if it's new, notify the doctor, mark the borders, okay, mark the borders, because that way if there's a subcutaneous dysphysema, if it's like what they're saying is, if it's a small area, then it'll begin to spread out. So if you know, it's kind of like when you have a wound mm -hmm. and you're marking on the um, dressing what you see there, and then if it gets bigger, then you, you, know, you know you might have an issue or with an infection of some sort, okay? Uh, what else? Has the thoracic cavity, uh, catheter been pulled out of the chest? If there is a pool air leak, apply dressing, like we said, with your hands, uh, but release it periodically or at any signs of respiratory distress, okay? So we check it, make sure it's okay. Notify the doctor immediately and prepare and prepare for replacement of the chest tube. <coughs> when that guy pulled it out, did the docs have to come back up to the floor? Yeah, we came to the floor and after they got it reinserted and got the drain, trying to get it somewhat stable, they had to transfer into the unit. So okay. We got, See? Him back, we got him back up. Thank you. Later. They ended up transferring him to the unit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what they, that's what should have happened. Yeah. That's what I would have thought would have happened. Yeah. Yeah. Cause he was, they needed to put him down. So he ain't care y'all ass, but that's what they were doing. <laughs> <laughs> and then he came back to the floor, he still had him, but he had already pulled his photo. Oh, they didn't handle him, huh? No, he's in the middle of the floor. Okay, uh, are all the connections securely taped and banded? We want to make sure that's done. Uh, is the tube patent and free of kinks? That's important, it's in red, always, always. Are there any dependent loops in the tube? Okay, and is <coughs> the clamp open? Is the clamp open and then here, do y'all have this on your PowerPoint? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You do? Okay, so you'll know what to look at and all the little answers that go along with them in order to help you with your studies. Okay. All right, assessment of the chambers. Assessment of the chambers. What is the characteristic of the drainage? Okay. Uh, what is the character of the drainage? Is it bloody? Is it straw color? Is it purulent? All uh, that needs to be charted. Okay. What is the rate of the drainage? So if you're checking to see how much drainage you have um, every one to two hours or however the doctor's ordered you to check, um, then you need to be knowing what the rate of the drainage is, how much is coming out, all the liquid stuff like that if you have to chart it. Um, has the drainage stopped suddenly? Hmm. If it stopped suddenly, that could be an issue. If you had like uh, a 50 cc's, 100 cc's uh, uh, 30 minutes ago and all of a sudden bam, nothing, it could be an issue. Um, are the columns only partially filled? Well, we need to make sure that we check those and look at that. Look at this, how that looks. That looks terrible. And I can imagine coming out, that's a huge, that looks like a huge bore needle going into the uh, to the side over there. And I can just imagine pulling that thing out when it's time to come out and all the stuff that comes along with it and that big tube. And 
Okay, end of tracheal tubes. We're not going to get into in, uh, ET tubes because that has um, a lot of stuff that goes along with it. I still don't forgive y'all. <laughs> I have to go home and have a long recovery. I don't need you to party. I think I got to take one plus star And then the other girl, she didn't probably It's no binding. We asked about extending the time. We asked about extending. I'm trying to let y'all go. We asked about extending your time on the SIM chart since it wasn't opened originally, and we can't because of the time that it has to be in and time to get graded. Okay. Unlike clinicals, we have to grade that paperwork before you come to SIM, and you still have three days. We do apologize. Um, and that's it for me. For me, and I need you. I need you. Okay. Oh, and whoever, uh, they decided, after they started collecting them, they told us, 